This is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and uh, in this talk I'd like to share a message for students of mine, for Catholic children, and of course I'd hope that their parents would listen to this first and then allow their children to listen to it uh, as long as uh, you find it agreeable to your own convictions. When we read the lives of the saints, when we read history lessons, we read of the lives of courageous, heroic men who undertook great works. It's October 11th today, and yesterday was uh, the celebration of Columbus Day. And on Columbus Day, we celebrate the accomplishments of a man who undertook the adventure of sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, having no idea of what he would find at the end of his journey. What he thought he was going to find turned out to not at all be what he found, and what he ended up finding turned out to be far more incredible than anything he could have imagined. And we read stories like this about these amazing, heroic human beings. All through history, all through the lives of the saints, all through the history of the Church, we read these lives of heroic, amazing individuals. And then we look at our own lives and we find Catholic kids barely doing the minimum requirements for their studies, wasting time sitting around, playing games, reading nonsense books that are never going to help them in any way, with none of the dreams or aspirations and goals that we find in all of the people whose lives we read about. Christian children seem to have a very hard time talking about what they'd like to be or what they'd like to do when they grow up. And I think that there are some notions that come from religious sources that quench the courage and desires that are natural in a human soul. Human beings are really amazing. Human beings possess souls that allow them to do things that animals can't do. A cow, for example, will never run into danger. A human being, however, can be moved by love or by anger or by courage to run into a burning building to try and save another person's life. We don't find things like this among unreasoning animals. This is a human activity. Humans are courageous. Humans are noble. And yet, we rarely find Christian children thinking the kinds of thoughts that are unique to human beings. We rarely find children talking freely about dreams and goals and aspirations that they have for their future. We rarely find children talking about problems that they'd like to solve, that they'd like to devote their lives to solving problems that they'd like to fix, evils they'd like to eliminate, and so on. We often find them talking about 
jobs. Everything seems to end in a job. Everything seems to be answerable to, well, how are you going to make money? How are you going to this? How are you going to that? And then we go back to the stories of the saints, to the lives of ancient heroes, to great military battles and heroic conquests. And there's this contradiction between the lives of the people we tell our children about and the life that we actually allow them to live. There's a difference between the lives of the men and children that we read about and the life that we actually live. And as I said, as a teacher, and I've been working in education for over 20 years, I've always found it very hard for Christian kids to talk about their future. And one of the reasons why is because they are led to believe that talking about their future is arrogant or that it somehow dishonors God, that in some way children shouldn't think about ambitious desires or dreams that they have. They should simply think about serving God in some way. But that's never really made clear. It's never articulated what that means. What does it actually mean? It's one thing to say that I want to serve God. It's another thing to say, I would like to serve God by doing this. I would like to serve God by being this. I would like to serve God by accomplishing this, and so on. The saints didn't simply say, I would like to serve God. They pursued particular missions, particular works, particular enemies and challenges. And what they said was, I want to serve God by doing this. And that's one of the differences, I think, that exists between Christian children and the saints and heroes. Alexander the Great grew up and said, I want to conquer the whole world. And he did. We study the people who pursued their goals in life. The people who are in the news every day, the famous people that are talked about from day to day, are men who pursue their goals and work to achieve things that they usually dreamed about when they were children, still pursuing them in old age, the things they've dreamed about and desired their whole lives. Modern Christian children seem to be suppressed in this kind of goal-oriented living because they feel that the only answer we're supposed to give is, I want to serve God. But the question is, how are you individually going to serve God? What are you individually going to do? What problem are you going to work to solve? What need are you going to work to fulfill? That's, that's what we should be thinking about. And the answer to that is found in who we are as unique individuals. In, in our English composition class, the first thing that students are taught, because this English composition course that we have is a really wonderful course, the first lesson that students are taught is that you always have something important and interesting to write about. Because your personality, your experience is unique. Just like we tell children your fingerprint is unique. It's a unique identifier. No one in the world has the same fingerprint that you do. And that's just a symbol. 
of the reality that no one is like you. No one is like you. That's not just true of your fingerprint or of your DNA, supposedly. That's true of your thoughts. That's true of your body. That's true of your personality. That's true of your friends and family members and connections. All of these things mix together in God's wisdom to produce you. You are a unique individual and you have unique work to do. You're not asked to be like everyone else. You're specifically asked to be you, just like St. Francis was unique, St. Dominic was unique, St. Benedict was unique, St. Teresa of Avila was unique, Mother Teresa of Calcutta was unique, and they pursued their own interests in the service of God. They didn't simply say, I want to serve God. They said, I want to serve God by doing this. And their unique work was bound up in their unique person, their unique soul, their unique situation in life, their unique place, their unique desires and interests. And they sought to serve God by doing some specific thing that was unique to them, something they wanted to do, something that they loved or something that they desired, to fight against something that they personally hated and wanted to defeat. It was their unique mission in life. Now, we often hear people talking about, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know what God wants me to do. And that's, that's a false question, or that's a false statement, I should say. Because we do already know what God wants us to do because he's given us his commandments. He's already told us what he wants us to do. He's already told us, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to worship and serve him alone and no one else. He told us he doesn't want us to take his name in vain. He told us he doesn't want us to work on the Sabbath day. He told us he doesn't want us to dishonor our parents. He doesn't want us to kill or steal or covet and so on. God has already told us what he wants to do. That isn't a mystery. He's already told us what he wants us to do. We're free as individuals to do the work that's unique to us and our desires and simply need to make sure that what we do is always within God's commandments. God doesn't tell us specifically how we ought to serve him. He simply tells us to serve him. He tells us to obey his commandments. He doesn't tell us what specifically to work for in this world. He doesn't tell us to brush our teeth. He doesn't tell us to cut the grass. He doesn't tell us to fix a leaky pipe. These things are within our own understanding. These things are left to our own judgment, to our own freedom, to our own choosing. We know with perfect certainty what God wants us to do because he's revealed his commandments to us. The actual individual life that we live is for us to decide, for us to choose. 
for us to offer to God as our sacrifice, our gift. And it's to be uniquely our own, just like if there was a birthday party and everyone was told to prepare a gift, wouldn't your gift be your own? Wouldn't it be unique? It's your gift. It should represent you. It should be unique. Isn't the worst thing about giving gifts the fear that someone else might give the same gift? The person who receives the gift is most excited to receive your gift when it has something unique to you in it. And our life is our gift that we offer to God, and it should be our own. It should be unique. And we're free to choose what we're going to offer to God. And we should be excited about what can be done by us in this life, looking to the saints, looking to famous people from history and seeing how they chose to pursue great things. Many of them overcoming great obstacles, coming from humble circumstances to achieve the things that they wanted to achieve and offer their lives as gifts to God in worship and thanksgiving. Yet often in my teaching, as I said, I, I meet with students who are bored, aimless, unhappy, and when I ask them, well, what do you want to do in your life? What, what do you want to accomplish? What would you like to be? It's as if they've never even thought about that question. They just go through the motions every day, living like the cattle out in my pasture, rather than the human beings that they read about in their books. For some reason... Christian children who claim to be concerned with serving God end up living more like cattle than human beings. The church doesn't ask them to live in this way. The saints don't show them to live in this way. History doesn't teach them to live in this way. Their own souls don't want to live in this way. And often we find people willing to take risks and suffer for the sake of sin after they've almost been trained to think that it's bad to be willing to suffer and sacrifice for something good. My work is often very hard on my body because I have to spend a lot of time at my desk and it's, it's not healthy, it's not good to work the way I work. It's not, it's not something that I would recommend to someone who is seeking to make their body healthier. And my mother, for example, or my wife will express concern and say, you know, you're going to have back problem if you do this. And if, if you don't do this, you might have heart problems, which, which is false because I do exercise. They just like to exaggerate things. But we can turn on the television and watch football players smash into each other at 30 miles an hour, giving each other concussions, breaking bones, tearing joints apart. And everyone cheers because they're pursuing a championship. They're fighting for a prize. They're working to win a game. And yet if someone were to live like that for some Christian mission, they would be discouraged and called irresponsible, imprudent, and so on. And I simply disagree. I grew up playing sports, and I was constantly putting my body at risk of injury for the sake of winning a game or making a play. And I was cheered and applauded and given awards for it. And when I became a Christian, I said, I want to live my life with the same 
aggressive, disinterested attitude in my Christian life that I've lived with in my life playing sports. If I'm going to have a, a sore back, let it be from my Christian teaching rather than from some ball game. If I'm going to have a heart problem, let it be because I worked to do research and not because I overexerted myself on a football field. Let my injuries and pains and problems come from my Christian work. But this is never supported. Even though the same kid could go and participate in a sport and be pushed by his parents to go ahead and risk for the sake of winning a game or making a play. That's what's wrong with our view of the Christian life. What if we lived as courageously and with the same desire to win as Christians in whatever particular mission or project that we desired? What if we, what if we pursued it with the same zeal that we pursue sports and games in? Children would have dreams of what they'd like to do when they grow up. And they would understand that these goals that they set were going to be gifts that they sought to offer to God to make good use of their life. Not to try and preserve it or save it, but to spend it. We used to say in sports, leave everything on the field. To spend it for God. Mother Teresa said, life is like a bar of soap. It's meant to be used up. We don't preserve the soap. We use it to clean our hands. We use it up to serve its purpose. And when it's done, it's done. It would be good to see Christian children who look into the future and set heroic goals, who set noble goals, who dream about accomplishing great things and who fix their eyes upon them and make it their mission. A mission that they love, a mission that they're passionate about, a mission that they're willing to sacrifice and work for. That's where motivation to study comes from. That's where motivation to work comes from. That's where motivation to pray comes from. And when we have Christian lives with no goals, no, no aspirations, no enemies, because we simply walk around staring down at our feet like cattle, we're not going to find kids who pray kids who study, kids who work, kids who sacrifice. We're not going to find those virtuous kids simply because the kids are not seeking virtuous goals, goals that are exciting to them, goals that make them wish they never had to go to bed and eager to get out of bed early in the morning. That exciting, active life only comes where Men and women have goals that they're eager to achieve. And we have to avoid this modern problem we have of quenching all of these desires in Christian children. I don't know why we do it or how we do it, but the Christian children just don't seem to have aspirations and goals. They don't have anything that they want to work for or accomplish. They don't have an enemy that they'd like to overcome. They don't have a prize that they would like to win. They don't have a problem that they'd like to solve. They just wander, moping around day by day like cattle in the field. And it shouldn't be this way. 
kids should be looking ahead and thinking about what they'd like to be and what they'd like to pursue. And they should, they should trust <coughs> that as long as what they desire is within God's will, is in agreement with His commandments, as long as the things that they desire don't require that they transgress God's commandments, that they're good things that they desire. Everyone is free to pursue his own mission in life. Everyone needs to pursue his own mission in life. They simply need to avoid sin. And so I hope to see students freed from this dark and gloomy, slavish, moping around, barely doing anything, because they, they just have all the life sucked out of them. It, it's as if their soul was taken out of their body. I'd like to see kids who are excited about future plans, about goals and desires, things they'd like to do, things that they're going to pursue with their whole lives, noble and courageous and excellent goals, worthy of human beings, worthy of boys and girls who are of the same nature as the saints and all the heroes that they read about in their history books. Our children should have ambitions like these, desires to be great, desires to be famously virtuous and heroic, not desires for honor because that's not in our control, not desires for money because that's not in our control, but desires for greatness, which is always in our control. So encourage your children, if you're a parent, encourage your children to set noble goals and don't, don't quench their aspirations. In the famous story of Braveheart, there's a famous line as it was put into film where he says, all men must die, but not all men truly live. And we need to cultivate this spirit, this spirit of courage and virtue, spirit of justice, faith, hope and charity as far as God grants them by His grace and arouse these virtues, encourage these virtues, stir up these virtues in our children and encourage them to set great and noble goals and go after them with all their might. Like the book of Ecclesiastes says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Like the motto of the Jesuits at the time of St. Ignatius of Loyola, to do all things for the greater glory of God. Those are the words, those are the langu- that's the language that our Christian children should be growing up with. I encourage you to listen to great Christian hymns with your children. Listen to the hymns learn the words, memorize the words, because they're, they're virtuous and they're heroic. Stir up this heroic virtue in your children, because it's human. Encourage them to set goals. Encourage them to pursue their desires and ambitions, to become the next generation of heroes and saints. They're not going to do it living like cattle. They have to be free to be human and to live to the glory of God, to offer their lives, like St. Paul says, as, as living sacrifices, offering their life, their achievements, as a gift to God, as a gift of thanksgiving and praise to God. I'd like to see that spirit 
aroused in Christian children. I'd like to see that spirit at work in the students in the academy. And I think parents are often putting kids in contact with the right stories, with the right books, with the right lessons. But sometimes parents are countering all of that arousal of virtue by quenching it all with groundless fears and a contrary spirit which does the opposite. And if you're a student, what are your goals? What would you like to do in your life? On the day that you die, when you're being buried at your funeral, what would you like to be true of you at the end of your life? What would you like to have achieved? What would you like to have defeated? What would you like to have solved? What would you like to have overcome and completed. You have your whole life in front of you to do that work. Make your life count. Make good use of the opportunity you have. And live not reading about saints, not studying the lives of heroes. Live like those heroes. Live like those saints. But serve God in your own unique way. That's why you were made to be who you are. Pursue your unique mission in life and don't sin. And offer your life as a gift to God. It's exciting to be a human being. It's exciting to think about what we can do. It's exciting to know that God is going to raise us from the dead and give us eternal life as long as we keep his commandments. Within those commandments, let's take this brief life that we have that we're already told is going to be given back to us forever and let's use this temporary life we have for some good purpose. Let's offer it as a gift to God, as a testimony of our belief that we are in fact going to be risen from the dead. And let's live this present life as people who believe in the resurrection and life of the world to come. <laughs>